I'd like to welcome everyone to the last session of the Rita B. Leahy series for the semester and for the year. Uh, today's session is actually going to be recorded. So Jeffrey, if you'll go ahead and start the recording, you'll all get a little pop-up box saying that that's okay with you. I'd like to encourage everyone to leave their camera on. I know that we're all doing so many different Zoom meetings and it, it can become really easy to just space out and do other things. Um, but on the other side, it's really nice for us to see your faces as we're doing the panel. Um, before I introduce today's panelist, I want to just um, tell you about a few things. Uh, first of all, the grad school and the Career Center knows uh, what a tumultuous time this is for everybody. And we wanted you to know that we are all here to serve you. The grad school actually has a special page during the COVID um, for COVID-19. And there were three town hall meetings today that were recorded. And there's an FAQ section that has all types of information for support for our graduate students. Uh, in addition, career services is completely online. So you can schedule individual appointments with me. You can attend um, a number of upcoming webinars. And um, so it's, it's business as usual in that sense. The, the wisdom right now is that during this time, it's a, it's a super time to work on basic career skills, uh, things like working on written materials, figuring out the value you can add to employers, uh, being able to update your LinkedIn profile. And additionally, it's a great time to build relationships, to reach out and to do some networking and informational interviewing. And that brings me to tonight. So tonight is a networking opportunity. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, feel free to type them in the, in the chat box so that we, you don't forget them. The, the way the session is going to work is each panelist is going to have about 12 minutes to tell you their story. And I've asked them to be really real about how they thought about what they wanted to do, how they landed where they are, to share a little bit about what they do in their current jobs, and to share advice with you um, that they might have about um, navigating from the academic program uh, to work that you love. Tonight's panel is about federal careers. Um, our, our graduates go on to successful and satisfying careers in academia, in private industry, in nonprofit organizations, entrepreneurial ventures and startups, and the government, federal government and local and state governments. Uh, here in the DC area, the federal government is one of the largest employers. So I'd like to welcome the panelists. Um, they are going to actually speak in alphabetical order. And I determined that the order is the same, whether it's by first name or last name. So we're, uh, Karen is gonna go first, Luke second, Mona, and then Neil. And I'm, I'm using their first names because I want today's conference, this, um, this Rita B. Leahy series, to feel informal and personal and that you can really understand what kind of work PhDs are doing and there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, I'll be keeping time and I'm, I will give the speaker kind of a wave to let them know that they have two minutes. Um, I, Luke is going first and I know that he has another Zoom meeting at promptly at 5.30. So he, he will not be taking questions, but of course you can reach out through LinkedIn uh, to chat with him later if you'd like. And if you squeak a question in um, and we finish up the panelists, we'll make sure we address that question with uh, Luke before 5.30. Okay, so I think that's everything. Are there any, did I leave anything out? Nope. All right, we're good to go. Jeffrey, if you would mic me and uh, please let Dr. So I think we got a little confused on who's starting first. So uh, I'm Karen Eisenreich, and I'll be uh, talking to you guys first. I hope everyone is doing well and is adjusting to this new norm that 
has been a challenge for all of us. Um, I'm very lucky that my job is very portable, but it has been an interesting learning experience to manage my staff remotely. Normally we're in an office and I generally stop by people's desks, you know, at least once a day just to chat with my staff. So this is a new experience for me for sure. Um, I am currently a branch chief in the risk assessment division in the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics within the EPA. Our division is the science division that develops risk assessments under the Toxics Substances Control Act. So basically what we do, we do risk assessments for industrial chemicals. And what that means is it's every chemical that isn't a pesticide, because FIFRA handles that in our Office of uh, pesticide programs, or and what we also don't cover are the drugs or the personal care products that FDA covers. So our chemical space that we regulate is quite vast. So think of all of your plastics, all of your oils, gases, um, anything that we're using or touching right now it pretty much comes um, through the chemicals that make up that product come through our program to be evaluated. So it's a pretty big world. Um, I think the last time we updated our inventory, we had something like 78,000 chemicals on our chemical inventory. And we get about 500 new chemicals in every year that we assess for their uh, human health safety and their environmental safety. Uh, my job currently is to manage a staff of about 17 interdisciplinary scientists who have expertise ranging from data science, chemical and environmental engineers, toxicologists, including ecotoxicologists, which is my background. We have people who have PhDs and masters in physics, biology, epidemiology. We have industrial hygienists. Um, and so we're a highly diverse, academically diverse uh, group of individuals. And the last time I heard, I think this was about a year ago, that EPA, EPA is just behind the Department of Energy and NASA for the proportion of advanced degrees that we have in the agency. That means we look for highly talented and highly educated individuals to carry out um, the work of the EPA. In the risk assessment, in the risk assessment division, we assess the releases of all of these chemicals to the environment, the exposures to human health or to humans and to environmental organisms. We assess the hazard and we put all of that information together to conduct a risk assessment, which the result then goes to one of our sister, um, sister divisions to actually manage and uh, regulate those potential risks. So what's really nice about our job is that we stay in the science. We supply the support for those risk management decisions to be made. Uh, we get to use the science that we did in graduate school just in a different way, but it has high impacts on what chemicals we can use. And you know we're really working to protect human health and the environment. So there's a direct application of um, you know, of our science to protection. And that is one of the reasons why I sought out a, a job at the EPA, because you have that um, impact uh, to, to keeping us uh, safe. And you don't hear about us very often, and that means that we're doing our job. When we get publicity is when there's a problem and people or the environment are impacted um, if you don't hear about our particular division, that's that's where we want to be um, because that means everybody there isn't chemical there aren't chemical spills there aren't impacts from those chemical spills um, and the other other chemicals that we assess. So, in talking about my past to my current job, it certainly wasn't linear, um, and I don't think most people' career paths are linear. Um, but I'm going to take a step back and go back to my master's degree at Clemson University. That's where I first started uh, learning about environmental toxicology, and my master's is in environmental toxicology. And it was at that that time that I thought that I was done with school after I finished my my master's. And so I sought out a 
basically any position that I could get to start out my actual career. Where I ended up was getting hired for a term position at the USGS, and it was at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Laurel. And that was my first government position and my first, essentially my first job in the field that I was looking, looking for. Uh, it was a great start. I got to do some field research on the Chesapeake Bay with um, the wildlife to look at monitoring for contaminants. And I did some lab studies as well with birds on specific contaminants. Uh, but term positions are great when you're in the position I was, when you're just trying to figure out what you want to do. But it's not a long term, it's not a long term position. In my case, uh, my term position was funded for a couple of years on soft money, so it could not become permanent. And in many of our governmental term positions, there isn't a, a clear path to making it permanent. So you end up having to move on. And so in looking at additional jobs, there I didn't find at that time that there were too many positions open at the GS7 and GS9 level, which is what I was qualified for, that were permanent. And after talking with my supervisor at that particular time, that's when I decided to actually go, um, go get my PhD. And I ended up at, um, at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, which is part of, part of UMC. So my degree is actually from the MIS program. And there I basically studied the effects of PCBs and flame retardants on the, um, on the growth and development of turtles. And the reason why I did even chose this was because I really have um, kind of a passion for understanding how long-lived species are affected by these chemicals that are in our environment essentially forever. They even though we stop using them and stop making them, they persist in the environment and we're all exposed, both animals and humans are exposed to them. So I was really interested in kind of the impacts of you know, that exposure and um, you know, kind of relating that to humans, how might these exposures actually impact uh, critical developmental stages. I learned a ton in my PhD beyond the, the academic um, portion of it. I learned how to be independent. I learned how to lead. Um, I had you know, some, some volunteers to help me with you know, grunt lab work, but they have to know what they're doing. So leading, leading people, and these are the skills that I was learning that I think helps me get to where I am today. Um, when I was finishing my PhD, because I had applied for, already had applied for government positions, I knew the time it was going to take to get through the hiring process. And I think if anybody's ever experienced the federal hiring process, it can be very frustrating, time consuming, and it just, it can be very difficult. Um, you're competing with a lot of people. Some people, um, we've had experiences where some people are not honest on their applications and copy copy the announcement and paste it in their resume. So when human resources goes to look at the submission, it looks like they have all the relevant experience because they took exactly our words and put them in their resume. Um, I definitely had been on that side of the equation before. Um, I applied for jobs I was certainly overqualified for. Coming out of um, coming out of your PhD, you're qualified for a GS11. That's where you should be starting minimally. Minimally, and I was applying for GS7 positions, and I wasn't making uh, what you know what we call the cert, which is the list of candidates that are the highest qualified. Uh, I know a lot more behind the scenes things now that I've been in the position of hiring people um, in the federal system. But it's a very complicated process, and much of it is done in HR, away from the people that are actually looking for um, looking for the position. So uh, I started applying about six months before I was finishing my dissertation, and 
luckily I got the current position, well, where I started in the risk assessment division, I started as a technical person at the GS11 level and took opportunities to work myself up in the same division in uh, that management position. And again, I think for me, my PhD really set the foundation for those leadership, those leadership skills, but also provided the technical foundation because I still do technical work. So I bring in all of that experience into leading, leading my staff of, of highly technical people. It's just in slightly, slightly different way. Um, so the, the best advice that I can give is if you're looking for a federal position, start early and apply for anything that you think you're qualified for. And, you know, start getting that experience of interviewing and, you know, managing your profile on USA Jobs and, um, yeah, just seeing what's out there and getting your feet wet because it is a process. I've had experiences where it's taken almost six months to get someone in the door from the time that the announcement went out. So be patient and understand that the person you interview with isn't the person who you're contacting um, for the uh, where you are in the application process. It's completely different between the office that's doing the hiring and HR who controls the process, so to speak. So uh, it's definitely convoluted, but you know, you can always reach out to me and I can give hints uh, on it. I've been through the process multiple times. Um, it didn't go well the first time, but, you know, it's just a challenge. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you for uh, sharing that career is not a straight line. And um, we are going to move on to uh, Dr. Ibo now, Luke. And um, clearly I cannot keep track of the alphabet because I started in the wrong place. But um, Luke, we're, Jeffrey's going to spotlight you and I am going to uh, turn my mic off. And thanks and uh, please go ahead. Okay, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope all is well uh, with everyone <laughs> despite the COVID, uh, we will get through this. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Karen and uh, the University of Maryland for the opportunity to share, you know, my career pathway, uh, how I get into the federal government. Um, like Karen has just indicated, it's, it has not been a straight pathway, a straight line for me. And my case is a little bit, um, I would say, uh, strange or different in the sense that I have been an international student for a long, long time. Um, uh, I am a native of Cameroon. That's a small country in uh, Central Africa, for those who know a little bit about the geography of Africa. Um, coming to United States in uh, 1999. And uh, I was coming with um, uh, an academic background uh, with my uh, BS engineering in uh, agronomy. Uh, from uh, from University of Chang in Cameroon, and from Cameroon, um, I uh, traveled to Belgium. That's in Europe. <laughs> um, in 1999, where I got my master's degree in conservation biology. Uh, spent uh, two year and a half in Belgium. Then I decided that I want to do my PhD, but this time in United States. And <laughs> luckily, I got. Ex um, um, into a program called Green Card, and which uh, led me to United States uh, in, in 1999. And coming with uh, from um, a French-speaking uh, country, I have a very uh, little of English. Um, my English was very very poor, and uh, first thing I, I I decide to do is to you know. Um, make sure that I, I can speak uh, the language. And so because I have a strong science background, um, I took a job uh, teaching uh, in a public school uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, that wasn't very uh, <laughs> um, a good experience because of my accent and D.C. was very tough. And I, start, I, uh, I spent 
a year and a half. I couldn't finish the second year. And I got another job in Maryland in the middle school. And I thought that middle school would be easier, but it was even worse than teaching a, a high grade student in DC. Anyway, it is from a teaching uh, at Nicholson Middle School in Prince George County that I got into contact with University of Maryland uh, because it was closed. I was visiting campus and uh, I met uh, a professor, um, Dr. Sher Mohammadi. I think he's a uh, uh, vice dean or something now in the, in, at the university. Uh, and, I, and I told him my story, uh, my background, where I'm from, and he was from Iran, so he knew a little bit about uh, challenging the challenges for uh, international students. So he heard my story. He was very impressed with my background uh, because I had worked in Africa with the International Union of um, uh, Natural Resource Conservation, IUCN, uh, known, uh, also known as the Red, Red List uh, organization. And uh, I work with them in the Waza National Park Service in Cameroon, a very uh, well-known national park. And we were collecting uh, um, animal or wildlife data and using um, uh, hands and paper and pencil because in Cameroon we don't have technology. We would, you know, just walk across the park, national park, and uh, looking at the elephant, the giraffe, and just, you know, describe where we found them. And that wasn't, you know, a, 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 a methodology that could lead us, you know, to a, a, you know, a good report or, or result. So I spoke about that to Dr. Sher Mohammadi, and he said, oh, yeah, we have something called geographic information system, uh, which uses satellite uh, images to collect those data. You don't have to walk across the park and risk your life. You can just sit in your own office and you know navigate. And that was really impressive to me. And so he put me in contact with Dr. Uh, Hugo Montas, um, uh, the uh, animal science uh, uh, building, uh, the department of uh, yeah, the animal science. And so that's how I got in contact with Uni University of Maryland. That was about 2003. And so I got into the program and uh, I spent from 2003 to 2010. I graduated in 2010. I got my uh, uh, PhD uh, in biological resource engineering at the University of Maryland. But I would say that uh, four years before I graduated, that is in 2006, I already had a job with the US uh, Department of Agriculture. So this is to uh, let you know that you could, you know, get your job before you even graduate. So uh, I uh, really echo what Karen was saying. It is uh, important to apply long before you graduate because, you know, a federal job, it can take, you know, a tremendous amount of time to, you know, um, get to the end. So uh, I graduated in 2006. Uh, 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 no, I think I got my job in 2006 and I was still uh, working on my PhD research while already working uh, and at, with EFIS, that is Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, that's the agency within USDA right here in Riverdale, Maryland, not too far from College Park Metro Station for those who are familiar. So, um, working full time and continue to work on my uh, research in the office after work, things like that. And I, I finally graduated in 2010. But I would say that uh, while I was on campus, uh, at my uh, University of Maryland College Park campus, I was interning with uh, uh, um, the federal uh, government already. Uh, I did some summer internship with um, uh, USDA NAS, National Agricultural Sur Statistics Service. All right, so, and I heard about this internship uh, from the, uh, the Career Center, you know, on campus right there. And um, I said, hey, I'll try this. And I applied to that job. and. Through that career center, I think that's the same uh, center where you work at uh, uh, right now, uh, Susan. Um, I learned how to uh, uh, 
write a resume, right? My first resume, uh, at my first uh, resume write up, I was shocked because I, I was ashamed of the resume I had. All right, so I learned how to write a resume and through uh, a couple of sessions, I learned how to interview. So your resume and how to interview, the two first things that you have to know. All right, so, and by improving my resume, I got that internship. And so at the uh, USDA NAS, I help out to, um, to, um, to digitize map um, using GIS. Uh, and that same semester, I was taking a GIS class at the Department of Geography. So that kind of helped me there. And then the following year, I interned again with EPA, uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, DC. And EPA has always been uh, my dream place to work at when I came to Maryland or when I came to the United States, I want to work at EPA because I learned about EPA a lot. So I interned with EPA and while at EPA, uh, I helped them update their water, st water uh, standard uh, status report. And within EPA and during that summer, I connected with a lot of people there uh, trying to be friends with them, trying to be nice and helping them. Those uh, supervisors who uh, are not very uh, technology, technology savvy, I would help them, always ask them, do you need some help with this, your PowerPoint? I know you have this meeting, it should, can I have you? Things like that, trying to be friends. And that's how, you know, uh, even after my internship, I kept that connection. We keep writing, we can calling sometime and and this is something that i would recommend to all of you to to do wherever you are working whether it's shadowing or interning and things like that keep good relationship with people and then the following summer i got an internship with the u.s um, army corps of engineer at washington uh, aqueduct the dell uh, water treatment in washington dc and that that was in uh, I think August of two thousand and five, and that same period of time, my advisor had indicated that um, uh, the grant was ended, so I could I I had to pay my tuition this time, and it was coming hard. So I accepted this full time I interview, and I got that job with the U.S. Corps of Engineer, and it was a full time. Uh, my first full-time job, but um, it wasn't a federal. I was like a contractor there. So, but this was something that would give me some money to pay my tuition and finish my education. And in the meantime, since I had applied uh, with federal uh, agency USDA efforts, after two months with the U.S. Uh, Corp of Engineer, where I was contractor, I got this phone call from this man, he's called Alonso. He said, hey, Mr. Hibu, you had applied uh, uh, with USDA. Uh, are you still interested in the job? I said, yes. And then he said, okay, um, uh, we are about to conduct some interview and we want to hire in the next you know, couple of months. Can you come for the interview? I said, yes. And then so I scheduled my interview. And again, I went back on campus, did another round of uh, practice of interviewing techniques and things like that. And I went, uh, and then I know, uh, I was advised to prepare a good resume. I prepared my resume um, and I went to the interview and it was very impressive. And the GIS was one thing that had all, also helped me to get, in, to get that job. So I got hired and I've been with the USDA for 13 years. So what I do mainly is to write NEPA. All right, so I work with uh, PPD, that's Policy Program Development, which is in charge of uh, policy analysis and budgetary and regulatory development, which is not quite something I have learned on campus because I'm an engineer. So I had to accept you know, the regulatory or the policy job right here. But I also innovate 
by bringing the GIS, how we can use the technology to improve our business processes, which is something that I have brought and people have loved that. We use GIS now and I've been using GIS for mapping uh, and, and, and producing a map document to support the uh, NEPA document. And for those who are not familiar with NEPA, it's National Environment uh, Policy Act. Uh, I do ESA and then just species acts and et cetera, et cetera. I think my time is up now, so, <laughs> and so um, I can go on and on, but um, I can stay for a little bit of time for questions if, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I, I really am so struck by the power of networking and utilizing services. So <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for that promotion. Sure. Okay, we are now going to go on to Mona. So I will mute myself and Mona, thank you so much, Luke. Hello everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing good and fine and during this difficult time. Uh, it's a good opportunity for everyone to do things that we usually don't do. Like I spend most of my time in lab. So these days is a very good time for me to write papers that I have to write. Uh, you can you can see like there are lots of things that like people can do during this time and I'm, I, I feel appreciated. Uh, so about uh, my path, uh, same as Luke, I was international student with green card here and I joined a UMD and I was uh, a TA for a year and a half. And uh, so at that time, we had uh, some tough time with our project regarding the funding. So my professor just said that uh, this summer we can fund you. And I was, so we had to do something about our, our kind of just uh, living uh, costs. Uh, I had no connection. I uh, didn't even have a LinkedIn profile set up. And the only thing that I had uh, that I knew that I can look for was the UMD Career Center. So every day I looked at a website for the job openings and within a week, I found a position about uh, like a post -back position, something that was looking for some post -back students for the fabrication. Um, it was something that I was doing uh, at that time, kind of related to that. And so I just said that, okay, I'm gonna apply for that. No matter, like, my, I'm not fit for that, but I'm gonna apply and I'm gonna go, go and talk to them if it's necessary. Within a few weeks, I, a few days probably, yeah, I got a call and I went for the interview and I knew that I'm not suitable for that job because I was a student at that time and they were looking for a full-time person and I couldn't be a full-time. And then I couldn't be a full-time, yeah, employee for them. So I, before going there, I talked to my supervisor. I said that I'm gonna talk to them to see if we can have a joint program together. I'll do my work there and I'm gonna try to connect with the project that we have and what they're doing and see what we can get out of it. So my supervisor, um, Dr. DeVoe, uh, supported me regarding that. I went there and I talked to them and it turns out there can be a program between University of Maryland and NIH. That was the position was at NIH. And they, it ended up being an actual fellowship that is now established at UMD that uh, students from Department of uh, Mechanical Engineer can get their PhD from University of Maryland and do their research at NIH. And that wasn't there at that time. We just sat there and talked to about it and like discuss and like lawyers, lawyers from U UMD and lawyers at NIH discussed and came up with something. And it just started with just like us taking each step one at a time and not being afraid of we're not suitable for something. And then I got my PhD uh, from like it was a joint program, ERDA program uh IRTA you can look for it it's a very nice program it's all over NIH and uh, it's a very nice fellowship for PhD students as well GPP program and uh, then at that time uh, the lab that we were using at NIH I was doing fabrication for the x-ray imaging lab but I was using NIST's lab so I I built up some connection there as well so I knew people there working and like we started chatting and talking discussing about the projects that we were doing 
And then after my PhD, I joined, so with recommendation of my PI at NIH, I joined a postdoc at MCNR at NIST. So it was again, just a path that was kind of like continuing itself because we were just building our, like kind of expanding our project. So what uh, we decided, so the program, the postdoc position was that what I was doing in my PhD was about to do at, in my postdoc, just repeat it uh, for NCNR neutral uh, center, neutron center. And I was there for six months. And so until I finished my PhD, I already had a few years of experience working in, at NIST Clearroom. Uh, so it was a nice experience for me that it was not only PhD, but just experience, uh, having the experience being in that lab. That was something that everyone was looking for. So the postdoc position, they were so excited that, oh, there's someone who worked in this lab independently. And then I applied for this position at NASA. Uh, that uh, mm, the, the position at NASA was, again, just random indeed.com application. I had no connection, nothing about like to, to introduce me to, to this position. I simply applied, but they knew that I worked at NIST. So they were looking for someone who works at NIST. And uh, now I see like most of my colleagues are coming from NIST. So it was something that I, I wasn't aware of about it, but it was something that was really important. Then, so I got this position, it's a contractor position, but I realized that like being in these federal agencies, NIH, NISD, and NASA, I know that it's not that common that people hire you out of uh, nowhere. They need to know you in federal agencies, mostly at least the, the places that I've been at. And so almost like I would say 80% of civil servants that I know at NASA, they come as a contractor first or a postdoc or a PhD with an internship or something like you have to spend a few years at NASA, then become a civil servant. So I see the path that I can become a civil servant, but that's the path that we everyone has to like kind of go through. And uh, so right now I'm working in NASA supporting the Exclaim project that is a cryogenic balloon, a balloon born instrument that will survey galaxies and star formation history over the cosmological time scale. It's a very exciting project. Uh, I would say that uh, my, my PhD is in mechanical engineering. It's in a fabrication. Uh, my, my focus was in the uh, microelectrochemical systems. But you can see I used it at NIH for X-ray imaging lab for imaging lungs and kidneys. I used it in neutron center at, uh, at NIST that were like imaging uh, cars and like metals and different like studying the neutron behavior. And now I'm using that at NASA to detect uh, stars and like study the star formations, which is like the, probably one of the most exciting things that I could have done with this. So my recommendation for you is that uh, one thing that I always tell everyone, uh, there are lots of resources in this area that you can use. Just take a step and go for it. Carrier Center is something that like most of the agencies, they post it for, they're looking for UMD students. So they post something there for sure. So check it every day if you're looking for a job. Spend at least six months prior to your defense. Look for the position. It's a time consuming. There might be lots of interviews that you might you you're, you think you're overqualified, but you're not well prepared. It needs e e interview after interview, you'll get better. And um, I would say just uh, talk to people. Don't be afraid of reaching out to people. Email them, say that, okay, I'm doing this. I'm a PhD student working on this project, and I'm interested in your what you're doing. I was wondering if we can uh, chat a little bit and see what we can do. That wouldn't hurt at all. If you know someone, try them first. But even if you don't know them, if you reach out to people with a, with a proper CV that also Career Center can help you out with, um, that would not be some, I, I had no, I, my experience says that 
people uh, would not just discard and like all the emails that they don't know. They read their emails. So reach out to people and um, yeah, um, it's something that is doable. And I see in one of the questions, they would say that there are lots of uh, postings about government jobs that are only three to four days. Um, yes, that's true because they, they know what they're, they're gonna, who they're gonna uh, hire. Because based on what I said, like there are contractors, there are postdocs, there are interns that they want to hire. They just post it, but apply it anyway because they they see lots of uh, they they see all, all of the CVs. But I would say more importantly than more important than just simply applying for all the GS positions is that reaching to people while you're students, while you're postdoc, while you're just not uh, like in the desperate position of like having a job. Reach out to people and you can find the, uh, the, the where a nice place to, to, to land. Yeah. So I guess that was my <laughs> general <laughs> experience. And uh, mm, mm, I just briefly about myself, I would say I got my, my bachelor and master's in electrical engineering in Iran. Then I came uh, for a PhD as an international student. I got my green card here. I got my PhD in Department of Mechanical Engineering. So see, I wasn't afraid of switching from mechanic, electrical to mechanical. Just, <laughs> uh, but, but there were like, I was, it wasn't challenging at all. It was all the same. I, I, wasn't, I didn't need to do anything extra for that. And then, yeah. Then after that, NIH, NIST, and not right now, NASA. Mona, thank you so much. I am sure. so struck by your story, how one thing led to another, and that you were not afraid to step into what, what wasn't a permanent position. So thank yes. you for putting that on the table. Sure. Okay, I am going to mute myself, and I am going to let Neil tell you his story, and then we will move on to Q&A. So take it away, Neil. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just, uh, I just want to uh, set my little uh, timer here. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you. And I hope, uh, like everyone else said, I'm hoping everyone's uh, healthy and safe and y'all are doing well uh, right now. Uh, my uh, three uh, you know, key points that I would want to recommend are networking, uh, internships, and mentoring. Uh, those three uh, being uh, really important as far as uh, a career path. And um, I'll tell you my story, and you'll see how each one of those uh, became important. Uh, so in the summer of 2005, uh, I actually um, was working on my PhD there in the communication department uh, in, at the uh, University of Maryland. And uh, I had um, one exam done. I had my coursework done and I had one of my qualifying exams done. And uh, my plan at the time was just to finish my dissertation and go become a professor in uh, communication. And my focus was political communication. I studied uh, uh, US uh, presidential elections and uh, that was kind of my focus. So that was my plan. And uh, then uh, I said, you know, before I go and do that, uh, let me just take. Uh, a couple of months, see if I can find an unpaid internship. And that's literally all I was looking for uh, was uh, an unpaid internship to get some practical experience uh, in speech writing because I was always interested in speech writing. I actually had a background in uh, public speaking. I taught public speaking and, and debate at Maryland, um, also at Wayne State University in Detroit. Uh, and uh, I spoke in public speaking competitively. And I uh, wanted to just get some practical experience in speech writing and being a speech writer. So I was looking uh, around. I actually applied for uh, an unpaid internship with uh, my senator from Michigan at the time, one of the senators from Michigan at the time uh, on the Hill. Uh, but I was turned down. And even though I'm, I'm, all I'm seeking is unpaid internship, you know, they didn't want to um, accommodate me. Um, I also applied for a job there, but then I got the sense maybe they thought I was overqualified. Maybe they didn't want somebody working 
who's working on a PhD, you know, in their office. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that was in my mind. Ultimately, I realized that some people are going to feel that way about you. Some people aren't. So you just got to find the people who believe in you and uh, don't feel that way about you. And so I started networking. I started talking to people about how do I find this kind of internship. And I talked to a guy named uh, Pete. Uh, he was actually the speechwriter for Senator Patty Murray uh, from Washington State. And I had met him a couple of years earlier at a speechwriter's like round table event. It was kind of like a get together, kind of happy hour kind of thing. And he and I kind of hit it off. And then I invited him there to University of Maryland to actually give a talk to the undergraduates there. And so he and I had um, uh, some, some rapport, some connection. And that connection came in handy uh, because when I called him up, I said, you know, I'm looking for an internship in speech writing. Uh, he, uh, he was very kind, very helpful. Uh, he talked to me about what it's like to be a speech writer. Uh, he uh, put my name out on an email list for speech writers. And uh, there was a speech writer from Georgetown University uh, named Jan, uh, who uh, also uh, was part of that group. And she kind of put my name out there. And I knew her a little bit through networking also, because I would attend a speech writers uh, annual conference every year in Washington, D.C. I met a lot of these people. And eventually my name made it around uh, within a short period of time, uh, maybe a week or two, uh, to a guy named Tony. Uh, will it at the uh, university uh, uh, sorry at the FAA okay federal aviation uh, administration and uh, so uh, Tony uh, I was referred to him and um, I think my name was sent to him but then I was referred said uh, somebody said you know give him a call and I sent him uh, a note and uh, he was a, a very terse guy I had never met him before and he uh, said he wanted to see some writing samples. He was the senior speechwriter to the top person at the FAA. And so he just wrote back, and all it said was, samples and salary, please. Only your best stuff. And I was like, okay, well, you want to know how much money I want to make? I'm, I'm only looking for an unpaid internship. Uh, but I can send you a few samples. So I conjured up a few previously written speeches. In fact, one was just a fake press release that I wrote up. I made up a fake senator and just just so that he could see uh, my writing style and, and that I could I'd do um, that job. But I sent him like four things. And uh, some of it were previous speeches I had written uh, for myself in the past. And uh, I sent it to him, no reply. And uh, this was July of 2005. Okay, no reply at all. And I thought, all right, he's looked at my stuff clearly doesn't think it's any good and that's the end of it so three months go by it's now october and the semester fall semester started i'm teaching at maryland and i'm walking out of the dunkin donuts there in college park you know the one on baltimore avenue and um, i noticed that there's a buzz on my phone and he left a message and he said um hey i um, you know, can you resend your stuff? We want to take a look at it again. And so it turns out they had, they had just gotten, they hadn't looked at it. It just gotten kind of lost, uh, overcome by other priorities they had. So, um, then I ended up sending him, uh, back my stuff and he ended up asking me to, um, come in. And what I thought was an unpaid internship turned out to be, uh, a paid internship. They decided to pay me. And then a couple of months later, they offered me a job. Okay, so they liked me, hired me, and I certainly wasn't expecting that. And uh, by January of 06, I had accepted that job. And then I ended up finishing my PhD eventually. Uh, but I certainly wasn't expecting to be a speechwriter at the FAA uh, at that time. But uh, I've been there ever since. And that's how it happened. And then uh, Tony. And, you know, so, so, so networking, being willing to create internships, even if you're no longer a student, right? I mean, just, just offering what value you have, uh, knocking on the door, networking, letting people see the value that you bring, build rapport uh, with other people. 
Uh, and then Tony ended up being my professional mentor. Uh, I, I, he has been ever since. Uh, it's been 15 years. And uh, I won't tell you my age, but I'll say that the age I am now, uh, you know, he was that age 15 years ago when he hired me. And uh, he's been, you know, my mentor for the last, uh, you know, 15 years. Uh, so I've been at the FAA since then. And, uh, you know, as far as, um, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I would just as a recap, that's what I would stress is networking, internships, mentoring, you know, and he's been, uh, showed me the ropes, helped explain all the ins and outs, helped me to get a really good start on my career. I was always able to go to him, turn to him if I needed something. And that was really huge uh, for me. Uh, so, uh, you know, consider mentors and maybe in two or three different areas uh, of, uh, of your, your life. Uh, you know, uh, these are people that, you know, can help you. Um, some people in your workplace, but some people outside of your workplace could be one of your former professors. Um, consider, you know, um, having a good mentor. And uh, what I would uh, recommend also for uh, looking for a possible career in the federal government is, you know, check out usajobs.gov, uh, usajobs, that one word, .gov, and uh, you can just look for a federal position that might match your uh, interests. Uh, and uh, if you're a military veteran, uh, that can be helpful. You get veterans' preference. Uh, if you're not a military veteran, uh, you'll be likely competing against a, a military veteran. Uh, that could, um, you, you, you could be qualified for a job. You might not get it because the other person had the veteran status. I mean, that's, that's part of the, you know, kind of reality. Uh, but, uh, you know, keep trying on, on that. And, um, you know, at the FAA, uh, you know, we, as you may know, we run the, the, um, we regulate the airspace system and we provide the air traffic control service to move planes. And, uh, you know, right now we have our hands full because the aviation system is, is very affected and we want to make sure that controllers or traffic controllers are, are not getting sick. And we want to make sure that the, the towers and, uh, air traffic control towers and different other facilities are, uh, clean and, and everything. And then we're avoiding problems there. Uh, so at, you know, at the FAA, we have air traffic controllers, we have technicians, uh, we have, um, aerospace engineers, system engineers, we have program managers, we have just about everything. I mean, we have lawyers, uh, we have doctors, and there's, we have pilots. I mean, there's lots of different things that people do at the FAA. You could also get in as a political appointee if you're involved in political campaigns and your campaign wins, you could get a position in one of the, um, the agencies uh, in the federal government. And, um, you know, and also I want to echo uh, something that, uh, that Mona said, uh, you know, get in as a contractor, uh, get in as a contractor might be easier. And then when people see your talent and value and see you there every day, you'll have a huge leg up on the competition. If you apply for a position, eventually there's a widespread belief that a job in the federal government is, is hard to get. Uh, but uh, don't psych yourself out about that. I hear so many people say, I, I just think it's going to take forever but it wasn't forever for me. I mean, it was a matter of like a couple of months, right? Because if you impress the right people, you, you get your foot in the door somehow through an internship, you find the right mentor, somebody that believes in you, somebody sees your value, you network the right way. It can happen really quickly. So don't be attached to that, but be open to that, that it can happen really quickly. Finally, I'll say one last thing. Uh, recommendation, and that's to uh, improve your uh, communication skills. Uh, it was mentioned earlier by uh, one of the other speakers. Uh, communication skills, public speaking skills, maybe you join Toastmasters or something like that. Just imagine whatever your current skill set is, uh, just imagine adding communication skills to your portfolio, right? If you can talk effectively one-on-one -on -one, or if you can talk in front of a, a mass audience, that can be really beneficial for your professional career. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, and appreciate having the chance to talk to you, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, that was just fantastic. Every time we do this series, I feel like the universe gives us just the right mix of people uh, and their experiences. And Neil, I was just so struck 
by how you talked about leveraging conferences and connecting with people. Um, so thank you for adding that into the story. So let's go ahead um, and let's see if there are, anybody want to ask a question? Um, you can raise your hand and um, you can also unmute yourself. I don't think we've locked you down. Is there anyone who wants to go ahead and ask a question? Okay. Um, I have a question. Good. Introduce yourself and then ask away, Nicole. Hi, Susan. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm a third year PhD student in the Neuroscience and Cognitive Science program at Maryland. And I am about to hopefully finish my dissertation proposal soon and write up my dissertation pretty quickly after that. I'm hoping to graduate next spring. So I was wondering um, if you, how you guys balanced looking for jobs with finishing your dissertation. And especially since it sounds like some of you actually started your jobs before graduating. That's a great question. I'm gonna mute you and we'll let the panelists go ahead. Does one of you wanna, you can unmute yourself and just go ahead and talk about how you balanced it. Thank yeah, you. I could, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Neil. Yeah, yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, yeah, I can comment on that. You know, that is tough. Uh, I'll be uh, really honest. Too. You're working a, a new uh, full-time job and it's uh, demanding. You're trying to impress all the right people and you're trying to do as good a job as you can. And then you have this PhD, you know, this dissertation that uh, you, you still need to write. Uh, and that can be very difficult. Um, you know, and, and it, it, it's easy to just put that uh, aside, but then it, it's really hard because you, if you put it aside, you lose a lot of momentum uh, if you, you start putting it off. So my recommendation is uh, really uh, chunk it down. Uh, I know somebody who was in a similar situation and she said, I'm going to devote 30 minutes uh, each day and I don't care what I get done on my PhD, but I'm going to dedicate 30 minutes. And it turns out she ended up dedicating more. I had this other me method where I would say to myself, all right, I'm just going to do these two things for my dissertation. Okay, maybe it's adding a couple of source citations or maybe it's uh, uh, researching something. And then it, invariably, I ended up putting more time. Uh, so chunking things down, breaking them up in smaller pieces, uh, uh, you know, is a good idea. But that's a challenge. It really is. You have to be disciplined. Thanks, Neil. Karen, what do you think? So I did something, you know, similar to what Neil was talking about. Um, so applying for jobs, like, especially if you're focused, for me, focused on the um, federal government, and I did look into consulting as well, environmental consulting, the contractor route, essentially. Um, you know, you once you get your resume set, it works for most positions, and you just have to tweak it here and there for something. So it's just... It's really, you know, taking that half hour where you might want to decompress and do whatever, you know, whether it's go for a run, you might want to take that half hour and um, put it towards just, I'm going to do this part of my resume. And once you get that done, that's the big part about the big hard part, in my opinion, because everything is so automated now where you can just put even on USA jobs, you can do a search for the type of job that you are looking for. So if you're looking for biologist positions, you can search and have the uh, current job opening sent to you daily. Um, and so that it's a handy tool once you get it in. Um, when I was writing my dissertation, it, I didn't have any funding at that particular moment. So it was like, I, what I did is I set my defense date because that was the only way I was going to get things done and really have to be disciplined about it. So I set a reasonable defense date and then broke what I needed to do down into daily pieces. And I had to get that part done that day. Otherwise, I missed my schedule and, and um, you know, missed my defense date. And that puts, I mean, that puts significant pressure on you because you don't want to change your defense date. Um, but, and then I would always set aside like a half hour, an hour to do the job searching or to prepare for interviews or whatever whatever it might be that particular day. So it's really, I, I agree with Neil, it's compartmentalizing and you know setting small goals each particular day. Um, the one thing that I will add 
is that in my office, my division, we just had somebody defend her dissertation in epidemiology. And we were, we were able to grant her a flexible, a very flexible schedule so she could put in her full-time hours, but have days where she could just focus on her dissertation writing. Um, and that worked for her. It was definitely challenging because she was on all the time, but it worked because she was given the time to focus on her dissertation. So your employer may also have opportunities for you to have the space to get done what you need to get done because your employer is going to want you to finish your degree as well. They, they want your, your degree status. Um, you know, and most people I found in my career want to support their staff as well and support their, um, you know, their goals. So uh, that's something also to consider, uh, you know, working and finishing your dissertation at the same time is asking for flexibility. Um, Luke, I know you, you're going to have to run. Did you want to add anything before you dash off to your next meeting? Uh, my short answer to that question is to just put your resume on the usajobs.gov, right? Just create a nice res uh, resume, and if you could summarize your research, what you are doing, just put it there, right? And just forget about it. And now, if you have that 30 minutes that Ken was talking about, to go ahead and look for job, or maybe after your after uh, you're out of campus or after school and you have 30 minutes to search for job, you can do that. But your resume should be out there. And now we have LinkedIn too. You know, just put your resume there and you'll be amazed how many people are calling you or putting a uh, you know, um, note on your page, things like that. For me, for example, the, 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 the lady who made a decision hire me was impressed by the fact that I was using this GIS to manage a uh, biological agent that spread. And this lady, Susan, her name Susan, was um, facing a challenge with creeping bank grass. The creeping bank grass is kind of, you know, uh, that had invaded the environment and spread and by wind, by water, things like that. And, and, and USDA was facing challenges with that because they, Took some action uh, about you know uh, uh, deregulating creeping bank grass, and it was causing a lot of troubles. So they went looking for a way how they could, you know, potentially identify you know different area in space where creeping bank grass has invaded, and how they could manage that. And because my research was focused on managing using GIS geographic information to manage spreading agent. Uh, you know, plan, animal, thing like that. she was impressed. And she said, oh, this can help us. I said, yes. I had not finished my PhD. I was working on it. I did not even know. I was not even one half to finish it. But I, during my interview, I, I, I was impressing them like, oh, I can do this. I can do it. That's exactly what I'm working at, things like that. So even though I had not come to the end of my research yet, so, and they were looking at, and so they hired me. But managing creeping bangers was just part of, just part of what I would be doing. I can tell you, like I say, I did policy most of the time. That was most of the thing I was doing, policy, regu regulation, biotechnology, regulatory policy. And so just go and put your resume on usajob.gov. Describe a little bit of what you're doing and just leave it there. Just leave it there while you continue doing your research. And if you have that 30 minute time to do some research and about job, do it. But let your resume be out there with your email and phone number, things like that. Great, that sounds like super advice. And I understand you're gonna leave us, right? That's right. I'm going to go to my next meeting. Okay, that's super. And students can reach out to you through LinkedIn? Yes, yes. I'm on LinkedIn, and you probably have my email, too. So I am at USDA, uh, so look.hebu at usda.gov. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks thank for joining you. us. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Mona, you were going to weigh in? Actually, I... Um, Luke just uh, mentioned what I was about to say, that prepare your CV 
and LinkedIn spend a good amount of time on these two, your LinkedIn and like have a summary of your research, what you, you're capable of, your abil ability in LinkedIn and both your resume, upload it. And once you have your resume ready, you just will be one hour a day in the morning or late at night before bed. Just search for the job positions that are out and simply apply. That wouldn't take that long if you do it every day. So, but you want to spend some time on the this the resume and your LinkedIn first. Once you do that, then you it will be easy. Now it's interesting. There have been a couple of questions about the timing of things too. So let me just quickly say, I heard a number of you say it's great advice to start. Um, applying for things because it's going to take time to practice and you'll learn something from every application. So um, it's not a linear process. So it's totally okay to get your LinkedIn set up and then perhaps some recruiters may may search for keywords and find you. Um, if you set up some uh, job agents in USA Jobs and have jobs pushed to you, and you get that federal resume set up in the resume builder, you can do all these little pieces so that when something pops up, you're ready to go. And it's not like you're going to sit down and spend many, many hours on all of it. You can, you all are really good at multitasking as doc students. So you can work on these pieces. It's going to be an iterative process. And, um, you know, you apply for something. Uh, one of the questions asked is, what happens if my defense gets pushed out? right? I don't make the date that my expected date is on my resume. Well, I think the panelists have already alluded to that. You may, you may decide that you're going to take the job and, and finish up, or um, just having that, that job offer is going to really motivate you to get finished. So uh, don't, don't hold back and wait until all conditions are perfect to start applying for things because particularly in this environment hiring might be slowed down in some cases and and things may be done in different ways and some employers are figuring out how they're managing the job search process um, and getting things totally online so i always like to say plant the seeds and see what will happen okay let's see if someone i'm going to mute myself and let's see if someone else has a question Hi guys, I'm Ian Chambers. I had typed a couple of things in the chat, so I figured I'll just ask it now um, uh, out loud. Thank you everyone and hope everyone is staying safe. This is very informative. Um, I also am in a similar situation. I'm, well, geez, I've been in the program since January of 2013, but I'm trying to wrap up my PhD dissertation in animal sciences and molecular biology um, PhD, so a hard science field. Um, with this COVID crisis that could be delayed and my timetable is unsure but i'm trying to do this due diligence and am looking at jobs at usa jobs and i'm curious to get feedback on how you actually articulate that you're not done yet um and and do i say expected graduation august but could be as late as next year or i when people ask do you sit or do you, for some of these jobs they say qualifications phd do you say yeah, I have a PhD. And then when you get to the interviews, like, well, actually, I'm finishing it up because it's six months from now. I, I, I just am trying to understand how that actually should be approached or what you think may be the best advice uh, going forward with some of these opportunities, especially given the timetables. Karen, why don't you take that one since you already alluded to being on the other side of the equation? I love how you said that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've experienced both. I was actually offered my um, EPA, first EPA position before I defended. Now it was only two weeks before I turned in my dissertation when um, I had my interview. So everything was pretty pretty solid um, there for me, but um, they asked me that very question and I was just upfront and I said, I will be defending on this date. Um, and they said, ask when I'd be available. And um, I said, I just need two weeks after I defend. <laughs> um, to clean up my dissertation. In hindsight, I wished I would have said longer um, because they were a little bit surprised about that, but I didn't want to lose an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I just, you know, pushed it, um, you know, pushed it as close as I felt comfortable. But I, on being on the hiring side, we always ask our candidates when we interview, when, when is your um, availability date? And there's a lot of flexibility 
around that. Um, we have someone on hold right now that's changed their actual start date like three times due to COVID because they're currently in a position um, that is important for dealing with COVID. So they can't really leave their current job to come to start the new one at EPA. So we've been very flexible and it's been moved um, a couple of times. So there's, there's room to, to set your start date and to just be upfront. And then, you know, that's a, also appropriate time to sometimes, you know, gauging your interviewers. If somebody asks me, like, what are your thoughts on um, finishing my dissertation or defending while, you know, I'm on the job, you know, we could have that conversation there. I'd be very amenable to, you know, that upfront discussion uh, that wouldn't cause me to not hire an individual. Um, or my t the rest of my um, management team either. Um, so I would say go in with a flexible mind, but kind of gauge your, you know, your interview panel and, um, you know, see what kind of sticks. Thank you. There was a question earlier about soft skills. And uh, I could each of you uh, maybe start with Neil and then we'll go on to Mona and Karen. Talk about the importance of soft skills and the kinds of soft skills that either you've been developing or you know that your employer is really interested in. Yeah, uh, so I, I think when you when you when you say soft skills, um, is there a particular one you're referring to, like 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 communication? Is that considered a a soft skill? Oh, thanks. Thanks for saying that. Um, soft skills can mean a range of things. Communication skills, uh, the ability to manage your own time, um, the ability to set priorities. So it's that set of skills that employers are looking for. And actually, the National yeah. Association of Colleges employer and Employers do a survey every year. And uh, communication comes up there usually as number one. So it would yeah. be... Uh, other than things like GIS skills and data skills, it, it's sort of the, the the what you bring to the job as a human being, uh, some yeah. of the transferable skills. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think your ability to build relationships uh, is really important. Um, your ability to establish rapport uh, with people, you know, quickly and easily um, is very important. And these things are things that you can study and, and master and learn from people who, you know, who teach these things. Um, you know, one of the things that I do as a, as a speech writer, I very often have to, you know, I write for people and I have to establish a very good rapport with the person I'm writing for. But then when I acquire information for speech, I have to talk to a whole slew of people uh, in the agency, uh, people who are engineers, uh, lawyers, uh, aircraft safety inspectors, uh, air traffic controllers, technicians, uh, program managers, people who manage large systems, implementing new technologies into the airspace system which is a uh, you know an interesting challenge uh and there's tower construction building a tower there there's people with so much talent and uh and what i try to do is uh, build report if i'm looking for information from them uh i need to be able to build rapport. It's one thing for people to want to work with me because they have to it's another thing if if they want to right so you want people to work with you because they want to right they're inspired and how do you do that well if uh, you take genuine interest in them, take time to listen to who they are, uh, what brought them to where they are, listen to their story, they'll like you, right? Uh, and uh, and then sometimes when you when I don't need something from somebody, you know, a coworker, that's when I want to add value. Maybe I'll forward them an article on something that I know they're interested in, or I'll n note something about their favorite sports team that I know that they're interested in. Uh, you know, I'll say, hey, check this out. I thought of you, right? Uh, so things that build rapport, uh, rapport, relationship building. I, you know, um, I mentioned communication skills earlier, public speaking uh, skills. You could join Toastmasters or something. Um, also, uh, here's a one, a collaboration. Collaboration is a, 
a huge skill uh, now. It, this When I started at the FAA in 2005, it was not talked about. Okay, um, but about five years later, it was talked about. And collaboration means people, uh, you, you know, getting people's input before you make a decision. And it that takes some effort, uh, right? But if you can be very good at, you can have collaboration skills, collaborative uh, skills. That can be a huge, huge benefit. You know, I think about if you let a let a union and uh, you had to work with management, right? Or if you had to, you were part of one office in the agency and you had to work with a totally different office with a totally different boss, right? And how are you going to work and make that happen? Uh, so that's where collaboration, ne- uh, me- mentor, that's where, I'm sorry, collaboration and, um, and uh, rapport building can be really important. Thank you, Neil. Those are great. Mona, what do you think? What about soft skills? What have you learned through your experiences? Oh, you're muted. I'm trying to unmute you. Ah, there you go. Nope. Okay. Okay. Should be fine. All right. Um, so I uh, was mostly in the research labs, and what I realized that uh, one thing that is important for most of the research labs is that you be aware of what you're doing. You don't want to be an employee there. You want to have an impact. So you want to have a, like a voice there. So um, don't be afraid of like raising your hand and like sharing your thought. So that's that I, I personally noticed that that where that was very effective for my career everywhere that you might think that that's very trivial. No, just share it with everyone. And they want you to be part of the project. You're, you're there to be part of their project have to, and have your impact. So um, just share your thoughts and be aware of what you're doing. Try to think ahead of the, the, the place that you are, like see where this project is going. So just give some inputs, some feedbacks about the projects, about what you're doing and what you can do to be better, to, to make it better. Uh, write proposals, help them to like uh, write proposals. It's not just like uh, just a technical skills. These are something that just you just need to to you you, you can survive without doing all this, but that helps your career to improve faster than you expect. And uh, yeah, again, communication with everyone, working with other groups, try to uh, like talk to other people, try to build up relationships so that you can have a joint projects, joint ideas. Those are all things that can help you. Like most of the divisions are interested in people who are uh, like trying to combine ideas and come up with the new, new and better ideas. So that's something that I can share. Yeah, I'm just struck by you're describing, um, I think what's called on the NACE survey, taking initiative and being engaged and innovative. Mm-hmm. Yes. Great exactly. transfer yeah. skills. Yeah. I cannot believe how the time has flown. So we have a, we want to wrap up, but I'd, I'd like to ask each of the three of you, if you have a sentence or two of advice, maybe something you wish someone had told you while you were a student. Um, and then I'm, I have a few last minute things to wrap up. Uh, let's go in reverse. Karen, you can go first and then uh, Neil and Mona, okay? Oh, that's a, a tough question. Um, I, I think it's, you know, you know, when something's right for you and when something's not right for you and it's listening to that inner person, person talk. So I wish someone would have, um, you know, told me, told me sooner to, to go with the go with your gut and what your heart is saying when you're applying for jobs um because then you're more likely to end up into the one that you really care about like i am very fortunate because i am in a division that um an agency that i love i love the mission i'm you know all for it in my jobs along hours but it's fulfilling so i think just if i would have had just someone tell me sooner to do that, it would have been, uh, I, I would have gone through less pain um, earlier on in my career. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm hard pressed to think of anything that I haven't already, you know, talked about. I mean, certainly uh, networking, certainly internships, certainly mentoring, certainly developing your communication skills, uh, certainly uh, developing your collaboration and rapport building and relationship building skills. Skills. I just think that those are really huge. I think that when I was uh, working on my uh, 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 course at, uh, at Maryland. Uh, I'm, if there's one thing I might have liked, I might have liked uh, if um, you know professors were um, um, open to sort of giving you a full range of, of your options uh, as a, a career. And maybe sometimes I felt like there was a bias towards uh, you know just go into a tenure track, uh, you know uh, um, position, you know research kind of tenure track uh, position. I had some faculty members that uh, uh, were uh, uh, really dismissive of doing anything other than other than that, uh, yeah, and uh, and so I think I think professors ought to you know not um, uh, champion their own position, but uh, encourage you to pursue whatever it works for you best. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, and so I thought that's that's one thing I, I'd probably say. Okay, great, and Mona. Uh, Mona, you froze up. Maybe turn off your video and that will search, but once it's over, you feel so good about what happened. Okay, you okay. got why don't you start over with your advice? Okay. Uh, so I was I was saying that like my professor once told me, but I didn't believe him. But I would say that once your PhD is over, you feel so good about it. It's very normal that you feel frustrated right now. You feel discouraged. You feel like okay, what I'm doing is not gonna bring me like take me anywhere. But uh, once you finish your PhD, you feel so good about what you did. You feel so good about yourself. And this um, interviews will pass one day and you will end up like land on one position. And then you see the impact that you can make on the real, uh, like in the society, in like everyone. Recently, I saw a, a, a result of NSF research survey on PhD graduates that how impact and actual work that they're doing are a lot more important than the salary that they're making for PhD graduates. So uh, that's something that you will feel after you graduate. Uh, it will pass, defense state, set your defense state as soon as you can. Don't play around with your research a lot. Some, at some point you have to cut it. it. It's a never ending. Another PhD student will continue your path, but set your defense state and then go for the actual uh, impact that you can make um, uh, on people and on the actual field. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful note to end on. If everyone could unmute their unmute their mics and say thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists. Let them hear your voices, please, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining.